Hello everyone, I'm Michael and welcome to the channel. Today's episode is first in my series of videos on chromosomes. We'll be talking about the basics of chromosome structure and organisation, sex determination, as well as chromosomal disorders in humans. Timestamps and sources are down below in the description and any definitions you need will be displayed right here on the screen. We'll start out with a surface level introduction of what chromosomes are. A chromosome is a single large molecule of DNA in a eukaryotic cell, by which I mean a complex cell with a nucleus. A chromosome has a complex 3D structure made by essentially wrapping this DNA around proteins called histones. This wrap structure is pretty essential to condensing the DNA into the cell's nucleus. The uh, largest chromosome in humans, which is chromosome 1, would be several centimetres long if it was stretched all the way out. So this condensing that we do is important if we want it to fit in our cell, which uh, in humans can be about as small as 4 micrometres wide. The 3D wrap structure has another important purpose, transcriptional regulation, by which I mean it affects how active particular genes are within the cell. The degree to which sections of the DNA molecule is tightly bound to the histone affects how easily things like transcription factors can access it. Transcription factors are proteins which attach to the DNA and control the rate of transcription. This tightness can be modified by covalent modifications which basically means adding small chemical groups to the histone proteins or to the DNA molecule itself. I'll go into more detail about this when I discuss differentiation and epigenetics in a future video. So you might already be aware that humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes, or 46 chromosomes in total. This is mostly true. Human somatic cells, by which I mean any cell that isn't a sex cell, have this number of chromosomes. Gametes, or sex cells however, only have 23. Gametes only have half this number because each of their chromosomes forms a pair when they fuse to form a somatic cell. This means that human gametes are what we call haploid and human somatic cells are what we call diploid. Now you might have noticed that I kept specifying humans in that last part and this is because while the system of having diploid somatic cells and haploid gametes is true across large parts of the animal and plant kingdoms, it definitely isn't a hard and fast rule. Bananas, the ones we eat anyway, have three copies of each of their chromosomes. We have a name for this too, triploid. This triploid was selected for by farmers and benefits us, or those of us who can eat bananas, for one reason. Triploids, pentaploids, and indeed any eukaryote with an odd number of sets of chromosomes greater than one are characteristically sterile. What this means for bananas is that they don't produce viable seeds and, are, and so are much easier to eat. So how then do these bananas reproduce? Well we do that with a little help from us. Parts of the banana plant called suckers are removed and replanted to form a separate banana tree, similar to taking cuttings from a house plant and growing a new plant from those. This method of propagation does have the side effect of making all the offspring of these plants genetically identical, meaning that it, it is possible that every single banana you've ever eaten has been a genetic clone of every other banana you've ever eaten chilling. There's an unfortunate side effect to having creepy clone bananas though. In wild populations of organisms there's a certain amount of genetic diversity. This means that individuals within, within the population will have different degrees of natural resistance to various diseases. In this clone population however, if one individual is especially susceptible to a disease, then all the individuals are susceptible to the disease, meaning there's a fair chance that the population can be pretty much wiped out. This has happened once before not too long ago. Until the 1950s, the most popular cultivar of bananas was the Gros Michel, or Big Mike. You can probably guess what happened. Gros Michel banana plants were not particularly resistant to a fungal disease called Panama disease, meaning the population was reduced to a very small number of individuals, not able to support large-scale export. This meant we had to largely switch to the much less interestingly named Cavendish cultivar, which had a greater degree of resistance to Panama disease. Now, this was supposed to be the part of the video where I tell you a story about how banana flavoured sweets were based off the old Gros Michel bananas, which is why they don't taste much like bananas at all. Disappointingly, this isn't quite the truth, which is just crushing for me to admit. I was told this story back at university by one of my lecturers, and I've been boring my friends and relatives with it down the pub ever since, but unfortunately the truth seems to be close to the opposite. The typical banana flavouring is based around a compound called isoamyl acetate, which is an ester. 
Now, esters are compounds responsible for a lot of the flavours and smells of various fruits. Banana flavoured sweets contain large quantities of this compound, making the flavour a lot more intense than our more subtly flavoured Cavendish. Our mate, Big, our mate Big Mike, however, had higher quantities of this, of this compound, which would have made it taste a lot more like the sweets. So were the sweets based off the old banana cultivar? Uh, probably not. There don't seem to be any first-hand sources on the subject, and chemists who work in the field seem to think it's unlikely. But isn't the truth always more interesting than the legend? No, I don't think so either. Another species that diverges from the standard diploidy we tend to expect in somatic cells is the ant, as well as all insects actually. Ants have a system called haplodiploidy for their sex determination. What this means is that one sex, the female, has diploisomatic cells, and the other sex, the male, has haploid cells. The female essentially has twice as much genetic information as the male. You may have seen the implication of this. The gametes of both sexes are still haploid, but so are all the cells of the male ant, so how can a fertilized ovum, or egg, develop into a male ant? The answer is, it can't. Fertilized eggs almost invariably develop into female ants, Males develop when the eggs are laid unfertilized. So despite being able to father offspring, haploid male ants never have fathers themselves. The insect method of sex determination obviously differs from our own. And now that I'm talking about human sex determination, I have to make a distinction between sex and gender. Sex refers to certain biological aspects of an individual, generally defined by anatomy and physiology. And gender refers to a social construction based on behaviors and perceptions of oneself. Uh, the study of gender includes a lot of philosophy and psychology, which is really interesting and important to learn about, but it's a wee bit outside my lane and definitely a wee bit outside the scope of this video. I will, however, put some resources in the description if you want to learn more about that. Uh, we'll be discussing sex with regards to chromosomes in this part of the video, which is often seen as a lot less complex than gender, but as you'll see, that's not entirely true either. The two sex chromosomes in humans and other theory in mammals are known as the X and Y chromosomes. Typically, when a human has two X chromosomes, they develop as a female, and with an X and a Y chromosome, they develop as male. The word typically there is quite loaded, and we'll get to that in a bit. The Y chromosome contains a gene called the SRY, or sex determining region, also known as the TDF, or testis determining factor. The single gene encodes a transcription factor which triggers a cascade of inter interactions, including the secretion of testosterone, which typically lead to the development of a phenotypically male organism. By phenotypically, I am referring to the term phenotype, which is the set of observable characteristics of an organism, as opposed to the genotype, which is an organism's set of genetic material. Side note here, this system is in Therian mammals, which is a group that includes placental mammals, like humans, bears and blue whales, and marsupial mammals, like kangaroos, wombats and koalas. The mammals this excludes are the monotremes, like the platypus and the echidna, who have a sex determination system more similar to bird species. Bird sex determination has two chromosomes as well, but they're called the Z and the W which is similar to our X and Y, except that male birds have two Z chromosomes, which would make them what we call homogametic, and female birds have a Z and a W, which is what we would call heterogametic. This is different to our XY system, where the males are heterogametic and the females are homogametic. A 1993 experiment to determine exactly why birds determine sex in this way involved creating a line of triploid chickens with ZZW chromosomes. The resulting hatchlings were intersex with both testicular and ovarian tissue. Now this supported the idea that the W chromosome contained a sex determinant gene which caused the organisms to develop as female. This was criticised however as all of the chicken's chromosomes were present three times, which could have influenced the development of the organs. A 2009 study found a candidate for a sex determinant on the Z chromosome a gene called DMRT1. They used a method called knocking down, which is a way of reducing gene expression, on DMRT1 in ZZ chicken embryos. This resulted in partial feminization of the gonad in these chickens. These data supported the hypothesis that male development depends on a higher gene dosage of DMRT1, given by the presence of two Z chromosomes as opposed to one. 
Well, that side note took about two minutes, so let's get back on track to human sex determination. I mentioned earlier that the SRY gene triggers a cascade of things happening, including the release of testosterone. And then I got all weird and particular about that word typically. There are a variety of intersex conditions stemming from various altered interactions with testosterone in the body. And one such condition presents as a person being phenotypically female but having XY sex chromosomes. During development, testosterone is produced as usual for an XY individual, but most or none of the expected physiological or anatomical changes occur from this. This happens due to a mutation in a, in a gene for the androgen receptor, which reduces or completely stops its function. The androgen re receptor, unsurprisingly, is a receptor for androgens, which are hormones involved in male development, like testosterone. The androgen receptor binds androgens and then acts as a transcription factor to regulate the expression of other genes involved in male development. When a mutation reduces the function of this gene, it's known as androgen insensitivity syndrome, or AIS. This condition exists on a spectrum. Individuals with a condition with typically female external genitalia are diagnosed with complete AIS, and those with partially masculinized external genitalia are diagnosed with partial AIS. There is also mild AIS, where the individual undergoes typical male development but may experience some symptoms like infertility. Another intersex condition brought about by something being interrupted along this pathway is known as 5-alpha reductase deficiency. 5-alpha dihydrotestosterone, or DHT, is a modified version of testosterone which is made during the development of male genitalia by an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase. DHT is like testosterone on steroids, or testosterone on testosterone if you like. It activates androgen receptors much more strongly than testosterone, which is necessary as a sort of signal boost in early development. 5-alpha reductase deficiency, as you might have guessed, is a condition that occurs when a mutation inactivates the gene for this enzyme. The condition is autosomal recessive. Autosomal meaning that the gene is not on the sex chromosomes, and recessive meaning that the condition only occurs when both copies of the gene have the mutation. Individuals with 5-alpha reductase deficiency may have phenotypically male or female external genitalia, or somewhere in between. In the Dominican Republic, there are individuals known as huevadoses who have this condition. In general, they are phenotypically female at birth, but start to develop a male phenotype, including external genitalia, at around age 12, coinciding with the onset of puberty. In these cases, the large amount of testosterone released during puberty overcomes the need for the signal boost ordinarily given by the conversion of testosterone to DHT. Thus far, while talking about human sex determination, we've mostly focused on the Y chromosome. For this next bit, I will need to give a bit of background information on the X chromosome. Now, the X chromosome is a hell of a lot bigger than the Y chromosome, and contains many genes that the Y chromosome just doesn't have. Now, given that humans need two of each of the other chromosomes to survive, how do XY individuals, who only have one X chromosome, survive? Well, the answer is that we don't actually need the products of two X chromosomes to live. In fact, the extra gene dosage from two X chromosomes working at once would be lethal to the organism. But now you might be asking, isn't that just kicking the can down the road? What about XX individuals? How do they survive? And the answer is what's known as X inactivation. Now, in early embryonic development, cells with more than one X chromosome undergo X inactivation. All but one of the X chromosomes within the cell undergo epigenetic modifications, which stop its genes from being transcribed. The exact nature of these modifications uh, I'll talk about in a future video, that epigenetics video I mentioned before. The X chromosome is, that is inactivated becomes what is known as a bar body, and is distinguishable during certain types of microscopy. This means that in individuals with more than one X chromosome, different genes from the X chromosome are being expressed in different cells. And this is visible in organisms like calico cats, like these. The genes for these fur pigments are on the X chromosomes, and so when different X chromosomes are active in different cells, you get these pretty patterns. For this reason, calico cats are usually female. With that in mind, let's talk Klinefelter syndrome. Klinefelter syndrome is an aneuploidy, a specific kind of chromosomal disorder, meaning an abnormal of chromosomes are present in a cell. 
It affects about 1 in 650 live male births, making it one of the most common chromosomal disorders in humans. Individuals with Klinefelter syndrome have two X chromosomes and one Y chromosome, XXY. Typical symptoms are smaller testicles and decreased fertility, which can often go unspotted. In fact, it's estimated that around 75% of all people with Klinefelter syndrome never get a diagnosis. Sometimes symptoms can be more severe and include weaker muscles, lack of body hair and breast growth, among others. Sometimes even more X chromosomes may be present, XXXY or XXXXY, and with symptoms are generally more severe. Also, male cats can have Klinefelter syndrome too, and they can be calico cats as well. I didn't have a good way to link that, but I just wanted to put more cats on the screen. The way Klinefelter syndrome is diagnosed is through karyotyping, essentially looking through a microscope at a person's chromosomes, identifying and counting them. There have been a few apocryphal stories floating around for years that undergrad biology labs had to stop doing assignments where you will find your own karyotype, and this was apparently because too many students found more X chromosomes than they were expecting. Which would make sense based on that 75% estimate of Klinefelter's individuals without a diagnosis we discussed earlier. But maybe we should take the story of a pinch of salt. It could be the extinct bananas fiasco all over again. Although I think we can agree that if you have to make that discovery about your chromosomes, being in a class of 30 other undergrads and then having to write it all down immediately afterwards might not be quite the best time for it. Anyway, that's going to have to be all from me. Next time we'll talk more about aneuploides and how they come about, and I'll probably go off on some more tangents. I hope you enjoyed this one, and that you'll tune in next time. Please remember to like the video if you enjoyed it, it helps it get seen by more people, and subscribe if you'd like to see more from me.